You're listening to the Sunday podcast from Life Point Church in Santan Valley, Arizona. We hope you are encouraged by today's message. For more information, visit us online at lifepointaz.com. Hey, so who has the app here and got the notification that says you have a gift from Life Point? Anybody? Wasn't that fun? And then you're thinking like a free shirt or a mug? Nope, it's just me. It's literally, it was just me speaking to you, and you're like, ah, bait and switch. We got you, and you opened it, and you thought about LifePoint. Well done, Chad. Kudos to you. Um, no, we do have a gift for you. It's, it's not from us, though. It's actually from the Lord, and one of the things we're talking about today is that gift. What is your gift? What is the unique gift of the Holy Spirit that he placed on your life? And then question two is, how are you using it? How's it going? How, how do you like that gift? Did you know that? Did you know that it's not just a gift? It's not just a gift from God, right? Like me, that's my name. It literally means gift from God. Nathaniel, look it up. It's awesome. It's it's literally a gift from the Holy Spirit. It is one of his characteristics, one of his abilities, and, and then you get a portion of that. Isn't that wild? It said, and we know that Christ had all of them. Christ had every single one of them embodied in him which is why he was so amazing and could do what he did. But you and I, we each get a portion of it, so that way when we come together, we form one body. This is 1 Corinthians 12. This is where we're going to be this morning as we look at this gift. And my goal this morning is that you would walk away from here understanding not only your gift or begin to seek what your gift is, but that you would understand how important it is for you to be a part of the body of Christ with that gift. Okay, so that's what we're looking at. Paul's addressing now, this is a new section. Paul's turned a page, so to speak, in his letter to the Corinthians. And 12, chapters 12, 13, and 14 are one whole thought here, right? So I'm going to be picking from 13 and 14 a bit. And over the next, this week and next week, we're going to be looking at those three chapters because it's one thought. And you have to understand what he says in 14 to get some of the things he says in 12 as well, okay? All right, so let's look at this. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 12. If you have a Bible, you can pull it out. Otherwise, we'll have the words on the screen, or there's a Bible underneath the seat in front of you. All right? Here's what he says. Now, about the gifts of the Spirit, right? He's turning a page, new section. Brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed, or how I would have written it, ignorant. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God can basically curse Jesus. Jesus be cursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord unless he or she is upheld by the Holy Spirit. Can we just appreciate that for a moment? You cannot claim that Jesus is Lord Almighty unless the Holy Spirit upholds that in you. Sure, you can speak the words. You can speak any words that your mouth can physically form. But you cannot say it, understand it, and mean it unless the Holy Spirit gives you the ability to do so. Isn't that wild? Last week we talked a lot about surrender, and I just I appreciate how that in there basically um, reaffirms that idea of surrender, that even in my decision to say, as we sang in the song, right, that you are good, you are Lord, even your ability to do that is being upheld by the Holy Spirit in your life. Otherwise, you're just saying words that are meaningless. And you also, the Spirit of the Holy Spirit will never lead you to curse the name of Jesus. It will never divide itself. It will never stand against itself. It is always unified with the Father and the Son, three in one. Verse four. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of services, but there is the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Do you see a theme here? Do you see what Paul's doing? He's saying, look, you're used to praising idols and all different gods for different purposes. This is a God who serves many purposes, but is one, right? Whereas you used to go to a God for fertility, for marriage, for success, for the weather, for politics, you would pray to all these gods. He said, this is one God who serves all of these things. And he's going to continue in this theme in verse 7 as he goes through. Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To each of you one of these gifts of God's Spirit is given for what? Your good? For your edification? Right for the edification of the body, for the common good. You were given these gifts 
for the good of the church. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of that same spirit. (laughs) To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healing uh, by the same spirit. To another, miraculous powers, prophecy, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And another, an interpretation of these tongues. All of these are the work of one and the same spirit. And he distributes them to each one just as he determines. You see what I mean? Doubling down. Like he's like, guys... This is one God. There there is one God. This is not multiple gods. You do not go to different gods for these different gifts. This is one God, one spirit. These are all his gifts. And then he ends it with another surrender point. And he distributes them as he determines. That's another tough one to surrender to. How many times do you look at other people and see some of those gifts that were just mentioned and be like, I wish I had that. I wish I could teach like them. I wish I could speak. I wish I could sing. I wish I had the ability to serve or administrate or to lead. Right? And God's like, sorry. I gave you that gift. I determined it. You fit in the body where you are going to be in community in a unique way. And that body there needs you. And as long as you continue to try to wish your gift away, that body suffers. But as soon as you jump on board and you begin to plug in, you will see how uniquely you were made and how purposeful your gift is. Do you hear me? This is so wild when you see what Paul is getting to here. Paul is moving into a theology and an understanding that goes beyond just being like, oh, I'm talented, or, oh, he was born with a silver spoon in his mouth and had all the right trainers, and that's why he's got this. No, no. There is a unique gifting that is not just for you to be successful in life, but is to fit, and Paul's going to use this image here as we go forward next, into the body of Christ. It's pretty awesome. I've always wanted to be a singer, right? Nick Legassi up here, that big beard, just that voice, and just the rugged manliness. If I could get that too, if I could have the voice and the rugged manliness, but God knew I couldn't handle it. He'd be like, you'd be a mess. You'd be out there in the world doing your own thing. So I had to knock you down a peg and just be a speaker, right? And you barely have a voice for that. And if you're not good with that, God's like, I'll take that away too. God knows us. He knows what we can handle. He loves you. He has given you gifts for the edification of the body. So let's look at this idea of the body. Verse 12. Just as a body, though it is one body, has many parts, and all of its many parts form one body. So this is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit. See how he's still stuck on this? He is really wanting to get through to the people. There is one. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. Oh, uh, baptized into one spirit as to form one body, whether you're Jew or Gentile, slave or free, we were all given one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it would not, for that very reason, stop being a part of the body. See, I love this, because it's like, just because you don't like the gift you have, just because you don't like your place in life, doesn't stop you from still being a part of that body and being in that place, right? All it does is cripple the body, because now the hand, which is supposed to be doing something, or the finger, or as I've used in the other services, maybe you're the pinky toe, right? It's the nails always weird on the pinky toe and it gets weird bunions and sometimes they're crooked and have hair. Just me? They're weird, right? But maybe that's you. Maybe you're the weird pinky toe of life point. That's okay. You serve a purpose. You have a unique purpose. We'll talk about it. But just because you don't like it doesn't mean you're not a part of the body. If you're the ear, you shouldn't say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body. It would not, for that reason, stop being a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. And if they were all just one, well then, where would the body be? Where would the body of Christ be? If everyone in here was a singer, if everyone in here was a prophet, if everyone in here was uh, uh, a teacher, if everyone in here was an evangelist, what kind of body would this be? There would be no purpose. Think about that. If every person in here, look around, we were all evangelists. And we met every week to learn about evangelizing, but there was no one here to evangelize to. Why? Because we're all evangelists. You're not a body. You're just annoying noise is what you would be. (laughs) 
As it is, verse 20, there are many parts but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, and the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker, they're indispensable, pinky toes. And the parts that we think are less honorable, then we should treat those with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable, we should treat them with modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment, but God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for one another. If one part suffers, every part should suffer with it. And if one part is honored, every part should rejoice with it. So important. And we're going to talk about that concept later on because that concept exemplifies the very nature of the Holy Spirit, the very nature of what made Christ so incredible. Verse 27, you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all have gifts of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret? So the style of writing right there, we would look at it and we would call it rhetorical, right? The question doesn't need to be answered, we understand what he's getting at. No, Paul, not all are prophets, not all are apostles. And in his time, in the same type of Jewish rabbinical writing, that's exactly how he was writing it. The reader would have looked at it and gone, no, no, no. And so he ends with verse 31. So eagerly desire the better gifts, or the greater gifts. What? This should cause you to say what? You've just spent 30 verses telling me they're all the same, and the lessers actually are brought to higher honor, and the unpresentable, they have their own modesty, and now you're going to tell me I'm supposed to desire the better ones? What? So what's he talking about? Because that, am I the only one that seems like a contradiction? You just told me to be okay with what I have, that my part's unique, but that I should desire the greater gifts. So what's he talking about? To know what he's talking about, you got to go to 1 Corinthians 14. Uh, skip 13, go to 14. He opens up 14 by saying that the greatest of the gifts is the gift of prophecy. And what he means and why he states that is you have to understand the context of what the Corinthian church was doing. So the Corinthian church understood the idea of gifts as Paul would have spoken it to them while he was there and taught them of who Christ was. As Paul left and time went on, they stopped using their gifts to edify the body and the church and begin to use them more for their own personal fame, right? Nobody does that anymore in the church. And they begin to take their gifts and they begin in their church services to come up front and especially the gift of tongues was popular. Because what you would do is you would start speaking in another language. And by the way, it's a common misunderstanding that when you're speaking of the gift of tongues in a service like this, that it's some nonsensical babbling language. That's not true. It's actually a language. And we get that because we've translated it an unknown language. What it actually should say is an unrepresented language. Meaning, if we all in here spoke English and I all of a sudden started speaking Spanish, of which I don't, I promise, muy poquito, right? Uh, that means very little, so I'm told. El baño, then, then that's where it ends. That's where my Spanish ends. Baño. Thank you. I already had somebody correct my dialect. Baño. Appreciate that. What if I just begin to speak fluently? That's what the gift of tongues was. And then what would happen is somebody else who doesn't speak Spanish would stand up and know exactly what I was saying and have an understanding of that language. It was an incredible gift used to edify the body and used to show unbelievers there is something here at work greater than the false idols you're believing in, the mute idols you're believing in. There is a God who lives and who speaks through his people. But what had happened is instead of using it that way, people would come up, because their services were more informal, and they would just start babbling. And there would be no one to interpret it, and sometimes they'd go on for 10, 15, 20 minutes. Is that edifying the body? Is there anybody who's gaining anything, any knowledge about God? If an unbeliever is in the room, are they looking and going, oh, yes, truly, this is a great God? Or they're thinking these people are whacked out of their mind. They're nuts. There's no order. They just keep getting up and doing it. This is what Paul's addressing. 
And so when he says the greater gifts, what he's talking about, pursue the gifts that edify the body of Christ and bring the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven, not gifts that bring you your own edification. Okay? So that's what he's saying when he means there. You have to understand where he's going in 14. And again, if we were reading this letter, we wouldn't be reading it in parts. You'd be reading it in whole and get what he was saying. Okay? And then it ends. The final sentence is this. And yet, with all of this about gifts, I will show you a most excellent way. Anybody else think of Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure when I said that? It's the most excellent way. Nobody? Okay. And what's the way he's going to talk about in 1 Corinthians 13? Love. Oh, love. It is the most excellent way. Unfortunately, in church history, we like to swing to one side or another. We are like all the gifts, all tongues, waving flags, dancing, rolling down the aisles, speaking uncontrollably, dancing uncontrollably. You've seen those YouTube videos, right? Oh, my word, it's embarrassing to the church. And we like to swing that way. No, no, we're going to use the gifts. We're going to go all the way. And then we swing back the other way, and we go, nope, the gifts aren't active anymore. They died out when the first church uh, apostles died out and the first disciples died out. They were only used for the beginning and the building and the foundation of the church, and they're no longer needed anymore. That's a cessationist view of the gifts, meaning they had a purpose and a time, and they no longer are used. That, that <laughs> church history is hysterical because it is that all throughout history. It is just these far-swinging places. And you know where God lives? He lives right here, right here on the balance of grace and truth, on justice and mercy. And his truth is not on the far left or the far right. His truth is always the, the middle. It's the dividing line. And so what Paul is trying to get the Corinthians back to is he's like, stop using the gifts in a way that puff yourself up. Let me remind you what they are originally given for. And so with that in mind, we're going to look here. What are spiritual gifts? Okay. There's a few points to this first one, but the first question is this, if you're taking notes. What are spiritual gifts? First and foremost, spiritual gifts are abilities given to meet needs. Their purpose is to meet needs. Not to lift up, not to make popular, not to finish the building program, but to meet a need. And there's actually five lists of spiritual gifts in the Bible. There's one in Romans 12. We have the two that were just listed here in 1 Corinthians 12, what we just read. There's one in Ephesians 4, and there's one in 1 Peter 4. Each one of the lists are actually slightly different. Do you ever notice that? None of them are the same. Because Paul's not trying to put a comprehensive list of the Spirit's giftings on people. It's more of a cluster. It's more of a gathering saying, these gifts in these situations are from God for a specific purpose for his body to accomplish his will. So some gifts are the ability to communicate truth, like evangelism and teaching, right? Some gifts have the ability to bear burdens, like the gift of encouragement and of mercy, of services, of helps. Those are all gifts. You want to know how you know they're gifts? When I was a youth pastor, one of the most heartwarming, incredible things to see is a 15, 16, 17-year-old kid with the gift of encouragement. Because you all know 15, 16, 17-year-old American children are not natural encouragers of other people. Amen? Amen? Right? And when you see one in group that just naturally encourages, naturally lifts up people, bears the burdens of other people's pain, you'll see them cry with someone else even though it didn't happen to them because they feel their pain. They're the ones who reach out to the kid who's alone, who doesn't have any friends, and they're the ones who goes and grabs him and brings him in. That's a gift. That goes against human nature, which says, survival of the fittest, I need to make sure I'm okay. I need to make sure my status in this group is here. The gift of encouragement is often one of those gifts that gets looked down on as a lesser gift, right? Because an encourager isn't typically from the stage. I sure am not an encourager, I like tearing people down. It's part of what I do. And then I try to build you back up. And there's always parts left over, like when you take your car to the mechanic. But there are parts you didn't need anyway, I'm pretty sure. But an encourager bears the burdens, loves the people, and it's a gift from the Lord. 
And that's why encouragers are one of those ones that I want to encourage because so often they give of their time and their giftings to other people and rarely receive it back. Some gifts are to give direction. So you have leadership and administration, the gift of wisdom. Counseling is a gift. There is no human need, spiritual, physical, psychological, or relational, that the gifts of God do not cover. That God has not empowered his body and his church to meet in anyone's life. Isn't that wild? Okay, second point under what are the gifts? They are given differently and yet given to every believer. It says in Ephesians, to each Christ has given a portion of the Spirit's power to meet needs. To meet the needs. Which is why Paul here in Corinthians says, yes, there are many parts, but as all the parts are together, it's one body. There is one goal with a body, right? One goal. That the body would be healthy and that in the health of the body, the world would see who Christ is. That's the goal. And so when you have unhealthy churches, what happens? It detracts from the beauty of God. It pulls away. It stains. It tarnishes. It it actually does the opposite effect. Rather than draw people to the beauty of Christ, it turns them away. And what creates unhealthy churches? Well, sin, obviously. But when the members of the body don't contribute, Or if you're dormant. If you're part of a body and you're dormant, it makes it so the body cannot operate at full capacity. So these aren't individually given. They're given so that when you use your gifts as part of the whole, it makes the church healthy. That's why churches are different from each other also, right? We can look at churches and say the charismatics are wrong, the Presbyterians are wrong, the Baptists are wrong. Look, it's, as long as they're preaching Christ and him crucified and they're preaching the Trinity and they're preaching a few core basic truths, a lot of it's just difference and variety. There's supposed to be variety. It's okay. God's actually okay with variety. Paul was okay with variety. You'll see that in his letters to the different churches. The church in Galatia is quite different than Ephesus and then way different than this church in Corinth. And Paul's okay with that. He's not telling them to all be one person and look like cookie-cutter people. That's another lie of the culture to say that this is what God wants. He wants cookie-cutter Christians. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. Lastly, for this one, what is the goal of spiritual gifts? What's the goal of ministry? What's the purpose of all of this? The purpose of all of this is to make disciples. The purpose of all of this is to draw people into an understanding of who God is and what his spirit is. What does that mean that when he left us, he says, I'm leaving one with you who is greater. Uh, I'm leaving with you my spirit, the Holy Spirit. Well, there is this professor of theology from the 1930s to 1950s. He was the professor of theology and Bible at Harvard University, right? H.J. Cadbury. It's actually an awesome name. It's fun to say. You should try it, Cadbury. Anyway, what he would do is he would get all these new undergraduates in, and then he would ask them what they knew about Jesus. Most of them knew very little about Jesus, but they would typically rattle off what they've heard or what their parents' ideas of him were or what they remembered of him from elementary school or from going to church and going to Sunday school. The truth is, none of them actually knew who he was, and most of them had never actually written anything that he had said. And so what he would do, he called it their virgin reaction, And they were always shocked when they actually read who Jesus was, what he said, and how he lived his life. And so this is the letter from one of his students about how he viewed Jesus after reading about him for the first time. This is what the student wrote. You read about Jesus, but who is he? What is he? Despite being absolutely approachable to the weakest and the most broken people, he is completely fearless before the proud and the corrupt. Despite being profoundly human and becoming weary and lonely and moved to joy and love and anger, we never see him moody. We never see him inconsistent. He is tender without being weak. He is strong without being harsh, humble without the slightest lack of confidence. He has conviction, but he's not intolerant. He has enthusiasm without fantasism. He has holiness Without Phariseeism, he has passion without being prejudiced. This man alone never made a false step, never struck a jarring note, 
This is life at its highest. Isn't that an interesting reaction from someone's first readings of Jesus' words and actions? And here's the thing, guys, with the gifts. The spiritual gifts are supposed to produce a life like that. That's the purpose. Which is why Jesus had all of them in in their totality, in their completion, in himself. To produce a life like that. And then God's plan was that you and I, that his creation made in his image, that his people, us, would then come together, form the church, and in the church, in, in our coming together, would create that same type of body. That alone, our gifts are mediocre when acted out upon themselves. But when brought together with the common purpose of edifying the Lord, it changes the world. And that's what changed the world. That's why the Christian church changed the world. We look at the Christian church now and we can't imagine that it would change the world, but that's how it started. Because people would see a church where all the members of the church were working together and they were exuding that kind. They weren't perfect. They weren't like Christ in that, but they exuded that kind of love, that kind of tolerance, that kind of education and righteousness for people because they weren't doing it under their own power or because they were these supernatural aliens. They each had a portion of the Spirit of God. They each had a gift. But when they came together, that gift was made mighty. Isn't that incredible? So Paul sees that they've begun to take this gift and they're just completely destroying it. They're they're using it for their own gain. They're using it for their own power and glory. And he's speaking against it saying, guys, what are you doing tearing down people who have gifts that you think are lesser than and promoting people who you think have better gifts and moving people around based off of this. This has nothing to do with why the Spirit gave us these gifts. This is the reason he's drawing them back to the wholeness, right? So what are the implications of this? Point number two. What are the implications of this for church life, for you and I? What kind of church does this create? Well, first of all, point one under two. There will not be any passive or unemployed Christians. Isn't that one fun? There will be no unemployed Christians in the church. No one passive. Well, this is awkward. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. You have been crafted with unique abilities, meaning therefore there are certain things good things, big things in the church God wants to use you for. And if you are passive or not doing it, then you are missing out. The church is missing out. The community is missing out. But all I do is set up chairs. All I do is get coffee. All I do is watch a few babies. I could go into the hypothetical, but you watched a child of a couple who came for the first time and they gave their life to the Lord. And then as that man began to read and get know who God was, his gifting was an apostle or an evangelist. And in two years, they go out and they begin to evangelize in a country where they haven't heard of Christ, all because you decided to watch a baby and that child care was there and they would have a little bit of time to sit, listen unhindered. You can never minimize your gift. You can never minimize the thing that you think that, that God has given you. Because you will only ever see the smallest slice of eternity and what happened. But the reason God has given gifts the way he has is because he sees the whole pie. The whole thing. And he sees how it looks and how it plays out. Which is why he's given gifts the way he has. To exercise and understand your gifts is to find your meaning and your mission in life. And here's the trouble with theology that churches have when it comes to this. Small churches have a problem because there's not enough people to do the work. And so four or five people have 10 jobs each, but they're actually only gifted in two of those 10. And so they do the other eight poorly. That's how small churches operate. If you've ever been part of a small church, 50 people, 30 people, less than 100. That's how they operate. And and those people get burnt out because they're doing things they're not supposed to be. But then big churches, we actually have it worse. 
And this is where I sort of put life point. Life point's in this big church category. We have a bigger problem because here's what we do. Uh, we look at spiritual gifts as outputs, right? As, as something that you are giving as sort of like a job, right? But I volunteer. And then what that allows is it allows for many, many people to come and just sneak in and sit down and receive input and then sneak back out and never have given anything to the church. And so the struggle is, what do you do with that when you're a large church and you've got all these people, all these gifts that are in your community coming, but nothing's being used. Nothing's being used for the kingdom. It cripples a larger church, right? Because here's the thing, is the goal of giftings is to produce fruit, not technical results or skills. Let me explain that. There could be a pastor of a 5,000-person church, but how many people who attend that church are moving towards discipleship, are engaged in relationship with the Lord, are engaged with their communities, and are engaged with the people in their church and the problems in their church and the needs in their church? The number 5,000 means nothing if it is not producing fruit in the hearts and souls of all 5,000 people. The numbers don't mean anything. God doesn't care about the numbers. He doesn't care if you spent your whole life trying to reach one person and you reach them, and that is fruit. That is success. He cares about the fruit. The fruit is what is important to God. If you are not doing anything with your gifts, if you're coming to church and only attending, listen to this, and it's hard to even look at people when I say this one, but Tim Keller said it, and so I'm going to steal it. You are violating the will of the Holy Spirit for your life. Yep, that's it. There you go. Okay. I'm going to do the rest of my sermon facing this way. Because it says, to each is given a gift. You are God's workmanship. You were made with purpose and meaning and love and dedication. And then placed inside of you was not just a, a, any gift. It's actually a portion of his spirit that you uniquely have. And in your community, it needs to come alive. It needs to be active so that the church, the body there, could be operating at full capacity. So we can love like Jesus loved. All 13, all chapter 13 is about love and how you love and how you actually accomplish all of these gifts in a way that means something. Paul's going to talk about that. But you can't do that when the body is operating only at half, half core, right? Because there's too many people just receiving the input with no output. Here's a second point. With this kind of uh, church, this kind of body, you can expect some contention and some conflict. You know what? Paul is okay with that. You want to know what's also crazy? Jesus is okay with that. God Almighty is okay that when his church, when his body is operating in a healthy way, we're going to fight with one another. We're going to not like each other. You're going to smell funny. You're going to look funny. You're going to say something about me and I'm not going to like it. It's actually normal. It's okay. And you think to yourself, now wait a minute, if God had a perfect church, wouldn't it be more like a musical where we all just danced and we came in here and we did the can-can and rhythm together and it was just like fairies and white and beautiful and ice cream and puppy dogs? Wouldn't that be what God's perfect church is? No, God's perfect church is a bunch of people who love God, are fully committed to him, are taking the gifts that he's used, that he's given them to use them to serve others and love other people. And in the midst of it, we fight with one another and we don't like each other and we occasionally take a right right hook. Sometimes, not always. Because why? Because if you can learn to love your brother and sister in the church in the middle of conflict and contention, then you will have the ability to love the unbeliever outside the church. You will have, the, yeah, that's a mic drop. Should I, should I drop it? It's no, there's no effect. Thank you. The first two services, I didn't have it there. Boom, mic drop. It doesn't it work when you drop this. It just falls right here and it's lame and it's embarrassing. But that's truth. That's what God wanted. That's what the church was supposed to be. A place where amongst one another you learned how to handle conflict. Think about it. You have children. You didn't get rid of them because they annoyed you. 
I know you wanted to. I know I, our kids aren't in here, right? No, nope. okay. Like you kept them. They vomited on you and they, they disrespected you and they told you no to your face. Nobody does that to you, but they do. And they do it a lot. They break your stuff. They're the reason you don't have nice things and yet you keep them. That's the family that God intended his children to be in the church. That we would bump into somebody else. We would have conflict, but that we would wrestle through it, that we would work through it, and that our love for one another would be greater than the conflict. And that when the world saw that, which the world did see that in the early church, they would be stunned and say, how? How do you do that with people who aren't actually blood, who aren't your physical family? It's an incredible thought. Lastly, and we'll close with this, the theology of the Holy Spirit creates a certain amount of contention that should destroy jealousy and pride. The purpose of the gifts and why Paul spends so much time on explaining the parts of the body and the differences and the uniqueness is that when I understand that without the whole body, I'm worthless. What's a hand if it's not connected to the arm and the arm's not connected to the body? What is it? It's worthless. It's a, it's a rotting piece of flesh that doesn't have much time on this earth and it doesn't actually serve its purpose. So in order to be purposeful, it has to be connected to the wrist here and then the wrist to the, I don't know these bones, I'm not going to pretend I do, but it's all got to be connected, right? The arm bone's connected to the patella? Nope. <laughs> We're close. The ribs? Without it being connected, there should be no pride because unless you're part of the body, your usefulness is virtually nothing. And it will only serve to edify yourself and puff up yourself. Spiritual fruit is what is produced when we're part of this kind of relationship. And here's the thing with spiritual fruit. What are spiritual fruit? Spiritual fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, humility, understanding, all that stuff. You are given portions of giftings, right? You're given maybe one, two, three gifts, maybe four if you're super special. But that's it. You don't get all of them. But fruit, you get all of. All of us get the fruit. We all get love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, humility, integrity, self-control. Now, I'd like to pick there. I would like joy and peace. I, I don't want patience. Kindness is right out for me. And self-control, no thank you, right? But you don't get to pick those. Those, God assumes that as you come into the saving knowledge of who Christ is and you continue to pursue after him, that all of those are for you. You get all the fruit, even if you don't like the fruit, like cantaloupe or honeydew. You notice how fruit trays always have tons of those and like four strawberries? What's with that? That's a sign. Never mind. The gifts themselves are not fruit. What you do with them and how you use them in the church is. And so I just want to say this as we close and I'll invite the band up here. I've talked a lot about people who maybe have a gift that's considered lesser than and uh, wanting greater gifts and all of that. But there's another side of it too. And I think there's a lot more of these people in the church. There are people who've been given gifts of prophecy words of knowledge, teaching, evangelism, apostles. And you're sitting there saying, no, I just want the pinky toe gift. I want the small gift. I want to stay out of this limelight. I want to stay on the sidelines. I want a gift that doesn't cause me to get too involved. I want a gift that if I back out of it, nothing really harms the family or anything. I want a gift that doesn't put me in jeopardy. And the fact of the matter is, there are lots of us that God is calling and giving gifts to that we are just scared to operate in. We're scared to move out in them because of how it could upend our life and our family. When I was 13 years old, I knew I had a gift for speaking in public, mainly because I was a dweeby little kid who was not good at much else, but when I took public speaking class with a bunch of other 18, 17, 16-year-olds in this small Christian school, and I did really well at it, and they all did poorly at it, I knew I had a gift there. When I was 17, 18 years old, I knew I had a calling. We didn't even talk about that today. We'll talk about that next week. 
I knew I had a calling from God on how to use my gift in ministry. But then I realized pastors don't make any money and there's not a whole lot of respect in the business world for them. And so I went and I wanted to be a businessman. And then what I would do is I'd make lots of money and I'd give that money to churches and missionaries and I'd be a really nice guy. You know what I mean. And so God let me go down that path for a while and then when he called me out in my mid-20s and said, hey, you know that gift I gave you that you've sort of been serving yourself with? And now here's the thing. I was a good businessman. In an industry where deceit and lying and drunkenness and all sorts of other problems happened, I showed a lot of character to my customers. I paid my employees more than anybody else was paying them at their rate. I was honest with people and my employees. I, I, was a, I showed lots of integrity. But the fact is, even though I was using my gifts, I wasn't in my calling. God had called me to something. He had shown me something. He had revealed a portion of his spirit and his plan to me. And at the time, I was just too freaked out to actually go pursue it. And I tell you that story because I think some of us in here are that same way. Because there's one more thing to gifts. is sometimes you're just given gifts for a season. And God will remove them. God will remove it. The toughest thing to understand and recognize is that when God has moved you from one season into another, right? And so for some in here, maybe at one time you were a business owner, you were a teacher, you used to lead in small groups, you used to have a home group, I used to do, I hear that a lot out here. Well, I want to encourage you, maybe God has put a gift, a new portion of his spirit in you and is calling you to something else in this season of life. Embrace it. Jump into it. Don't just keep looking back at the past and be like, oh, I wish I could do that. I wish I, I used to be able to speak like this or I used to be able to do that, but because of my injury or because of this, I can't do that anymore. God has not left you hopeless. He has not left you without a gift, a portion of his spirit. Maybe he's just waiting for you to say, God, where am I at now? He's like, I'm glad you asked. Let me show you. Those are the gifts of the Lord. That's the gift we have to offer you here today that reminder and that space in your life this week to stop and say, God, what are my gifts and what's my calling? Because you know what your calling might be to the business world. It definitely might be. Your calling might be your family. Your calling might be in another state. Your calling is something that God will reveal to you, but you got to pursue after it. You got to go after it. Let's pray. Father God, make us bold. I'm tired of being dormant. I'm tired of seeing great talent sitting on the sidelines. I'm tired of feeling like you've called me to run, but knowing that there's a body that's only half in, God, energize your people. Lord, there are so many gifts just sitting in this room right now. Prophets, teachers, leaders, administrators, servers, encouragers speakers of many tongues, interpreters. It's all here, God. Lord, help us to see it. Help us to see it and to open eyes, our eyes and to recognize we are strong when only when we're together. Bless this church, Lord. Bless the people in here as we move forward in this. And help us to run the race well out here in Santan Valley. In Jesus' name, God's people said, amen. Hey, we're going to take communion. We have three stations in the front, and we have three in the back. Gluten-free option in the middle in the back. If you have a relationship with Christ, we invite you to partake this morning. If you don't, we invite you to just abstain or come up and talk with one of our prayer partners. We'll be up front on either side and talk with them about why we do that, what's that mean. But communion was given to us and Christ said you do this in remembrance remember that from last week we remember to remember is a reunification it's a reunifying of a common purpose and a people with a common goal which is why he said when you gather together you do this in remembrance so he took the bread and he said this is my body he took the wine he said this is my blood when you partake of it remember what I have done remember that it is my spirit that unifies you. It is my spirit that strengthens you. And taste and see that the Lord is good. So let's pray and after
after I pray, you can get up, go to your station, you'll take the bread, you can dip it in the juice, and then go back to your seat and partake or partake right there. Let's pray. Father, bless this juice and this bread that without your blessing and without who you are and what it means is just juice and bread. Lord, when we take it in remembrance, we partake of the body and the blood of Christ. We remember the gift of the cross, the sacrifice of the King, and how you laid it all down to be back in relationship with us, your crown, your jewel. Lord, I'm in awe of that. That captures my heart when I take communion that you would have done that for me. For every person in this room, you saw us worthy, and you saw us worth everything. So Lord, we remember that now as we partake in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and get up now, and then we'll close with worship after everyone's had a chance. Male and female, surrender to your will, Lord. Surrender to your supper, Lord, to your community, Lord. Father, help us in that. Help those in this room who need to surrender towards a forgiving heart, who need to surrender towards repentance and give them the strength to do so. Bless this bread and bless this juice as we remember your body and your blood given to us that we might get to one day be in your presence fully. In Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead, you can get up. We have three stations in the back, three up front, and uh, we'll partake together and close in worship.